National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, this is the Evolution in the News story from March 2008, posted by Kristen Jenkins. Tanzania is located on the east coast of Africa and provides North Americans with many of their images of Africa, including Mount Kilimanjaro, exotic Zanzibar, and Lake Victoria. It is also rich in science, with the Gombe National Park, site of Jane Goodall's chimpanzee research, and the Old Vai Gorge, where many fossil hominid remains have been discovered. Recent research in Tanzania, in the Adzungwa Mountains, has yielded a wide collection of new organisms, including the Kipunju monkey, the Adzungwa partridge, and several amphibians and reptiles. It's uncommon for new vertebrates, much less mammals, to be discovered, so the Adzungwa Mountains are of special interest to biologists. These mountains are believed to have maintained a stable, moist forest environment for about 30 million years although the environment has become fragmented and is restricted to what amounts to islands on the mountains themselves. The stability and isolation of these areas has allowed a high level of biodiversity that has remained virtually unchanged for thousands of years. The most recent discovery in the Adzungwas is the gray-faced elephant shrew, or Sengi. Sengi live in various environments in Africa, including desert and forest. They generally use their flexible little trunks to search for insects, hence the name elephant shrews. Unlike their northern namesakes, which are mouse-sized and weigh anywhere from 100 grams, comparable to a king-sized Snickers bar, to as little as 2 grams, the equivalent of 16 pennies, elephant shrews are substantially larger, ranging from 30 to 500 grams. There are 15 known species of elephant shrew, and of these, three are considered giant, and now there's a fourth, which dwarfs the previous giants, weighing in at 710 grams, over one and a half pounds. Based on morphology, Sengis have been classified with various groups, European shrews and rabbits, just to name two. But recent genetic comparisons have led researchers to include Sengis with a mammalian superorder group, the Afrotheria. The Afrotheria are one group of placental mammals, those are mammals that nourish their young via placenta and bear well-developed young. Other superorders in mammalia include Eurocontoglures, Laurasiatheria, which includes most mammals such as carnivores, hoofed animals, whales, and bats, and the Xenarthra, which covers a few odd creatures like sloths and armadillos. The Afrotheria themselves are an odd group, including elephants, sengis, sea cows, aardvarks, hyraxes, and tenraxes. Doctors Kathleen Smith and Samantha Price of the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center are evolutionary biologists specializing in mammalian evolution. They have some interesting insights about the evolution of Sengis. So one of the, one of the interesting things in, in the evolution of mammals that we see is the whole way that the arrangement of the continents on Earth have changed and how that's affected the way different mammal groups um, uh, have evolved. So when mammals first originated, it was a time when most of the continents were in pretty close um, proximity to each other. We had sort of a big supercontinent where all of the land masses were all attached to each other or very close to each other. And then we see during um, uh, the um, uh, later periods through the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, so the most recent geological periods, these continents have broken up and moved around. And so we see, for example, that while initially they were in contact, and a lot of the mammal groups you see all over the place, we had a big spread of, of um, the continents that ended up being in the north, and this is a group called Laurasia, which combines North America, Europe, and Asia, and then the southern continents, which are Gondwana, and then this Gondwana, or these southern continents, broke up. So you had South America, you had Africa, and Antarctica, and Australia as separate continents. And one of the really interesting things about that is that uh, many of these continents really developed their own set of mammals that were very different from what we see in the north. And Sam will talk a little bit about the Laurasian mammals in a second, but 
in the southern continents, you had the Afrotheria, which seemed to really be the main mammals in, in uh, Africa. South America actually had its own radiation of mammals that were really different from what we see on the northern continents. And then we all know about the marsupials, which are the other major group of mammals that were really, although early on they were found in North America, they um, uh, really radiated in South America and Australia as an area. So we have, have on these, these funny southern continents that became isolated, they have really distinct groups of mammals. And later, of course, the continents have continued to move around. We had India slamming into Asia, and we had North and South America reconnected. And so you see these southern groups and these northern groups of mammals remixing. Uh, but Laurasia, which was a really big radiation, had a lot of really interesting mammals. Yeah, and that's actually the group of mammals that people originally thought the elephant shrews belonged to. And so you've got the primates and other things closely related to them. You have carnivores, you have the hoofed mammals. But the hoofed mammals, which are the things I work on, so that's why I'm going to talk about them, um, is where they put quite a used to put quite a lot of the Afrotheria. So they had the elephants and the hyraxes and Cyrenians quite commonly were put with the horses and rhinos. And so, and this was called, um, the, the rhinos and the horses are called perissodactyla. And the other, the penungulata is what they would often put it with. And then they put it with the other mammals in an ungulate group. And so quite often um, people still refer to these groups as ungulates, but now they're completely disparate across the tree, and so that term can actually get quite confusing sometimes. Um, and it, it shows that using the molecular data, we found that things that looked quite similar morphologically are very different. So Sam, the, one of the interesting things about this animal is it brings up the whole issue of a group called the Afrotheria. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Afrotheria is? I think this is one of the really interesting groups of mammals. They're so disparate in how they look. You'd never put them together. You've got elephants, you've got the elephant shrews, you have hyraxes, you have dugongs and manatees, and you have aardvarks. And this, you would never put these as closely related. And yet recent molecular evidence from DNA has put these together as a group of fairly primitive mammals. They diverged early on from the rest of the placental mammals. And previously, these uh, sangis or elephant shrews have been put in with rabbits or rats and things. And they look much more reasonable than closely related to elephants. But, but isn't it true that what we're finding out is now that we sort of have this hint from the molecular biology, we're actually finding out information as people are looking for things that they actually share some biology and they're beginning to, to find out uh, things in fossils that actually these, the primitive members of this group actually share some characteristics. I think they share mm -hmm. some characteristics of the teeth and some characteristics of foot bones and some other aspects of that. So that, that it's an interesting case where we um, thought they were different, because you look at these animals, and Sam's right, they're as different as you can imagine. Um, then the molecular evidence tells us one thing, that these things are related, and then we have, are going back and are finding new fossils all mm. the time um, that are confirming that it's a group. So it's a really interesting sort of the way science evolves, that you change your mind, you look at things different ways, and you also find new information, and you can find some of those things. Yeah. And the fossils are actually showing us, when we previously thought it was endemic to Africa, these older fossil groups are also in um, Europe and Asia and other places, so it's not purely an endemic African clade anymore, they're starting to think. So they evolved more broadly and then ended up in Africa, and then with continental drift, as the continents um, uh, moved away, that Africa became its own sort of island, and this group evolved there and really diverged into all of these really weird animals. And probably the re their relatives that were left in the northern continents were replaced by other groups of animals. Um, and isn't it true that in the past this group was a lot more diverse? There yeah. was. I mean, elephants are a great example of that. They're found all over Europe, and the, the, the dwarf elephants, and and the mastodons and all the, the, those relations are all over mm -hmm. um, the world. Mm -hmm. But now we only have two species of elephant in, in that. But, so these are called um, 
elephant shrews, but they're not actually shrews. Do you know, are, are they like shrews? Are they like the other? Well, so the shrews, there's, that's another kind of interesting sort of history of the way we think about things, because when we first shrews, they're, when I learned paleontology and mammalian evolution, we had this group called the insectivores, which was sort of a trash bas basket group where all kinds of different animals. We had things like shrews and moles were considered insectivores, things like this weird group called tenrex, which are also part of this Afrotheria, uh, were considered um, uh, insectivores. We had things like elephant shrews that were considered in this group insectivore, lots of fossil animals. So, so it was kind of a trash basket thing that anything that was uh, really exhibited really primitive mammalian characteristics was considered an insectivore. And what in the last 30 or 40 years, part of its molecular, part of its more um, sophisticated ways of analyzing um, uh, the relationships of animals, what we found is that there are many groups that are uh, very distinct phylogenetically, but sort of share these characteristics that we call insectivore. And so um, they look like shrews, and there's probably two reasons they look like shrews, and this is really an interesting um, a way that evolution works. Probably one of the reasons that they all look alike is that they, they basically, this is probably what the an, all of our ancestors look like. The ancestral mammal was basically a shrew. It was tiny, it ate insects, it was nocturnal, probably had a really high metabolism, probably lived in the undergrowth. So we're seeing animals that retain a primitive characteristic, and all of these other groups have radiated around it. But at the same time, they probably have, have had uh, other specializations with convergent evolution so that they have, because they're, they're still doing similar types of things, they've evolved similar characteristics. So it's a, probably a combination of a lot of primitive characteristics, but because they share the same lifestyle, they're retaining many of these same, um, same characteristics. Um, and, and they sort of got it right, you know, they sort of figured out that this is the way that you be an animal like me and why change? Um, and I think some of these things, sometimes they talk about um, uh, living fossils and there, there's been comments that this group hasn't really evolved much since the Miocene, but it's probably done a fair amount of evolving, but a lot of it is things we can't see. It probably has all of the morphological characteristics that let it do its job really well. It probably has the right ecology. It probably is in a pretty stable ecosystem that hasn't changed a lot. So that there really hasn't been much reason for it to change. There hasn't been much selection on it. The rich biodiversity of the Adzungua Mountains and the odd, fascinating creatures being found in this place reminds us that we have yet much to learn about our planet. Studying the evolutionary history of unique creatures like Sengis can help us understand the evolutionary forces that have shaped species and communities in the past, guiding our efforts to protect and nurture them for the future. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the Understanding Evolution website or the Nescent website. Check our archives for other stories. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution. 